With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, why many rural Americans may lose their access to a broadband program. But our top story today, the latest Consumer Price Index report, has both good news and bad news for food shoppers. Gary Crawford has more. The government's Consumer Price Index for January food prices is out now, and the verdict for food shoppers? So overall, the CPI inflation report was not as positive for food as, as we've seen in recent months when there were price declines. Agriculture Department economist Megan Schweitzer tracks retail food prices for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and she says this latest report did have some good news and a little bit of not-so-good news. The report says last month prices for some food items did go down, but the overall price index for all food at the grocery store went up. Megan says that food prices generally take a dip in December, which they did, and that did happen, paving the way for an increase in January. It is common for prices across the economy and also for food to increase in January. So we saw prices for food at home increase by 0.7% this month. But last January in 2023, we also saw food at home prices increase by 0.8%. It's a very similar amount. Megan does say this January's increase was a little higher than had been expected. Now, Megan tracks prices for grocery store food, so-called food at home, and also food bought from restaurants and such. Here's what happened with those last month. Well, food at home prices increased by 0.7% in January, and they were 1.2% higher than January of 2023. Food away from home prices rose by 0.5% in January and we're 5.1 percent higher than this time last year. But the really good news in all of those numbers there is that grocery store food prices are only a little over 1 percent higher than they were January one year ago. Now think back a couple of years when the food price inflation rate was well over 11 percent. So things are improving and prices last month did come down for a few selected food categories. So from December to January, prices declined for meats, and for fish, but increased for all other categories. Some of those foods went up significantly. We did see relatively large increases for a few categories. Fresh vegetables increased in price by 2.9%. Non-alcoholic beverages increased by 2.2%. And eggs increased by 1.8%. Now she's talking about price hikes for those products that happened in January. But there are products that we are actually paying less for now than we did a year ago such as eggs, dairy products, fresh vegetables, and pork. Now, it may sound far-fetched, but Megan says there's a chance food prices overall in 2024 could average less than the year before. Last time that happened was in 2017, so a rare occurrence, but... It's not unprecedented. That's right, and would be very welcome indeed. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Some experts say that by following the best available science, policymakers can ensure farmers and biofuel producers can continue leading the transition to clean energy. Chad Smith reports. Growth Energy CEO Emily Score says that sound science includes using the GREET model to boost the emerging sustainable aviation fuel industry. We have a unique opportunity to get sustainable aviation fuel into emerging markets, and it's critical that we take advantage of that. Crop-based inputs are the only viable sources of clean, renewable energy available in large enough volumes to truly decarbonize the skies. To get there, the U.S. Department of Treasury must ensure that biofuel producers can take full advantage of new tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act. That means using the GREET model to properly reward climate-smart agriculture. Some political forces are looking to meddle with the data collected by the GREET team at Argonne National Lab solely to cut farmers out of the SAF market. That's why we're continuing to urge IRS to follow sound science when it comes to eligibility for new tax incentives. Several groups are calling on the Biden administration to inject different assumptions into the GREET model. SCORE says those differences would not benefit the ethanol industry. For years, Growth Energy has warned that special interests are seeking to derail sound science. And and this time is no different. If their efforts succeed, it will effectively end any serious hope of decarbonizing air travel and directly contradict President Biden's promise that farmers are going to provide 95 percent of all sustainable airline fuel. It would also undermine the political support that will be needed to extend these tax credits for a longer term climate impact. 
The Biden administration has laid out an SAF grand challenge that can only succeed if America's farmers and biofuel producers can also succeed. That requires policies based on the most accurate models of ethanol's climate benefits and incentives that reward investments in proven techniques like cover cropping and no-till farming. She talks about the right solution. U.S. ethanol is a sustainable fuel, and the most updated science continues to show that bioethanol delivers a nearly 50 percent carbon reduction compared to gasoline. And we're using the same number of corn acres that farmers have used over the last century. We need policymakers to support investments to further reduce the carbon intensity of American-made ethanol. That's why it's critical that this administration protect the scientific integrity of the GREET model from political meddling. Again, that's Growth Energy CEO Emily Score. Chad Smith reporting. In today's national spotlight, producers are seeing a better outlook for hog profitability. David Geiger has this report. Hog profitability has turned around in the last couple of months. That is according to Dr. Steve Meyer with Ever.ag. He forecasts break-evens now at $85. Things have gotten much better. Back in December, when I first estimated uh, profits and losses for 2024, I had a minus $12 and change per head for what we thought was going to happen in 24. That number, as of last Friday, is a plus dollar and 66 cents. So, that's nothing to write home about, but it beats minus 12. Meyer estimates six months of profits. However, the average producer may be 5 to $6 higher on costs. Still, the direction is right. It's coming off a terrible year last year. In fact, uh, by the model, even worse than 1998 was. And yet uh, we're kind of headed in the right direction here. So it, it's... Uh, it's kind of a breath of fresh air as we go through late winter here. Meyer says there are only three things that could bring back profitability. Either costs have to go down, demand improve, or supplies cut. Well, we're, we're getting two of them for sure. We're certainly getting lower costs. And if, as you look at the USDA's Ag Outlook Forum last week and the acreages they've got in and the yields they've got in and the carryout, I mean, 350 million bushels of beans and 2.5 billion bushels of corn. I mean, we're going to get some break on costs here, probably even more than we've seen. Meyer says demand may get better and exports have been great. Global Agritrans, USMEF think we're going to be up another 4 and a half, 4 to 5 percent this year. Uh, the Mexican peso is strong, and that's our number one trade customer. And so I think the export side could be good. So. I think we're going to pick up some on cost and some on demand, maybe. Meyer does not see supplies or the sow herd getting cut, and productivity is up. In exports, the USDA now projects a 34% increase in U.S. pork by 2033, from just under 7 billion pounds to 9.34 billion. I think the issue on that is going to be how does the United States manage that kind of growth and the risk that that entails of, you know, exporting 30 or 30 percent plus of our production. We're at 25 now. I'm David Geiger reporting. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's Will Jordan with more Livestock News. In today's Livestock News, highly pathogenic avian influenza is no joke, and it seems like it may be around for a while. Across the country, infected flocks have been depopulated to prevent disease transmission, a considerable economic hit to each producer impacted. For the latest information concerning HPAI, its impact on poultry flocks, and prevention and mitigation efforts, USDA's Rod Bain has more. When it comes to the current status of highly pathogenic avian influenza in our nation, the Agriculture Department's chief veterinarian recently offered a one-word response to state directors and commissioners of agriculture. Still. As in still around, according to Dr. Roseberry Sifford. This current outbreak of high path AI actually began almost two years ago and as of January of this year, was credited for the slaughter of nearly 82 million birds, mostly egg-laying poultry, in 47 states. I think we've seen our surges, and we've seen the troughs over the last couple of years. In the October, November, early December time frame, we saw another surge. We are still very consistently seeing that the surges are associated mostly with direct introductions from wild birds, and it's when you have wild birds in your neighborhood. Yet a silver lining can be found thanks in part to improved biosecurity efforts of bird owners. We are still seeing very low rates of farm-to-farm transmission, lateral spread. Because of the long-term nature of this current high-path avian influenza outbreak. We do have to really keep our watch up. I think in some cases we're seeing a little bit of fatigue and we're all tired of this now. But it's really, really important that we keep the message up that biosecurity is still supremely important, particularly if there are wild birds in your neighborhood. The chief veterinarian adds USDA and
and its Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service continues to review, evaluate, and adjust its response to HPAI cases as they are detected. We continue to look at our stamping out policy as a whole and whether that's still the most effective policy for us to consider. At this time, that definitely is where we believe that we are. In terms of what the rest of 2024 might look like, Regarding the trends towards a continued high path AI outbreak, we are still seeing detections in the wild birds. While the numbers are lower, they're still there. And so I would expect that as long as the migration comes back, at this point, it seems like they're going to be carrying the virus. So I think we should be prepared for that as we move into the spring. There's a lot of work going on around what's going on with this virus and how is it persisting in the wild birds. Hopefully, we'll learn more from that work and be able to use that to inform our procedures. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. In other livestock news, the American Sheep Industry Association reports that Michigan State University plans to host a virtual workshop on Saturday, March the 2nd, addressing a variety of topics for the small to intermediate-sized sheep and or goat farm. The topics often have greater interest to all producers. This series aims to inform and educate participants on health, nutrition, facilities, marketing, food safety, product quality, including milk, meat, and fiber, and more to help producers improve their management and marketing abilities. Those interested in starting or expanding their operation, refining their farm goals, understanding their options, and or improving their management will find the value in attending this workshop. The MSU Small Ruminant Extension Team plus invited guest speakers will be presenting and available for questions. Registration is required for this free event and closes on March 1st. Those who register will be sent an email prior to the event with Zoom link as well as given access to recordings of all sessions soon after the event. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact event manager Mike Metzger at metzgerm at msu.edu. I'm Will Jordan for Agnet West. Don't forget if you've missed any of our morning shows or if you just want to catch the news at a different time, you can subscribe to our podcast and have statewide agriculture news at your convenience. All you have to do is search for the Agnet News Hour on your favorite podcast downloading app. That's Agnet News Hour, and it is available on both Android and Apple devices. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Hours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agnet West headlines, here's Agnet West Farm News Director Brian German. The overall export value of pistachios last year was largely similar to levels that were seen in 2016. UC Cooperative Extension Specialist Brittany Goodrich explained what those similar values mean when adjusting for inflation. Really, the pistachio value in terms of 2023 dollars has gone from in 2016, it was about $5 per pound in terms of 2023 dollars. Now it's down to about $3 per pound. So you can see a much more drastic decrease in terms of the pistachio export value once you factor in that inflation. And I think growers, you know, are really seeing that. They're seeing higher input costs of just about everything and prices that are similar to, you know, what they were back in 2016, which just means there's less money to go around. Stradivation Group, along with partners like the Agricultural Retailers Association and the Fertilizer Institute, plans to conduct year two follow-up research on the row crop biologicals market. The initiative is being conducted in collaboration with the Biological Products Industry Alliance and aims to understand evolving farmer perceptions and market dynamics. The study titled Biologicals, Row Crop Farmer Value, Perception, and Potential will focus on factors like effectiveness, sourcing, and future expectations. The research seeks to provide detailed insights to biological companies aiding in strategic decision-making and farmer-focused strategies. Emphasizing the need for detailed insights, the study invites sponsorship from interested parties to gain access to findings and contribute to informed plans. The initiative underscores the importance of biologicals in enhancing agricultural sustainability and informs policymakers about regulatory considerations. Market concentration is limiting growth for U.S. ag exports. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack is emphasizing the need to expand agricultural export opportunities. Over the last two decades, U.S. agricultural exports have become increasingly concentrated. In 2023, market concentration was at its highest over a period. Our top four markets consistently accounting for over half of the total agricultural exports. Now, this is true for our bulk as well as our processed agricultural products. Now, we remain committed to our established customer base, but we're setting our sights on new growth opportunities in places like 
Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. There is increased competition in our export markets. Additional investment and market development is needed to keep ahead of the competition. Every year we learn some valuable lessons and we work hard to regain market share. Creating new market opportunities is one of our top priorities. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is set to open the enrollment period for the 2024 Dairy Margin Coverage Program. Beginning February 28th, dairy producers will have the opportunity to enroll in the program that provides price support to offset milk and feed price differences. The enrollment period will remain open until April 29th. For those who sign up for 2024 DMC coverage, payments may begin as soon as March 4th for any payments that were triggered back in January. USDA's Farm Service Agency has revised the regulations for DMC to allow for adjustments to production history, aiming to better reflect current production levels for smaller dairy operations. The National Milk Producers Federation is encouraging all dairy farmers to consider signing up for DMC, highlighting its importance as a safety net amidst fluctuating market conditions and low producer margins. The California Olive Oil Day is coming up next month in Stockton. The Olive Oil Commission of California will be hosting the event at the Cabral Agricultural Center on Thursday, March 7th, beginning at 8.30 in the morning. The first presentations of the day will highlight water management strategies for hedgerow olive orchards, nitrogen management field trials, and the effects of olive cultivation practices on oil quality. There will also be a grower panel on water inputs and orchard management. Other topics of discussion include the epidemiology and management of olive knot, evaluation of new fungicides, and benchmarking data for the olive oil industry. There will also be updates provided by the American Olive Oil Producers Association, as well as the UC Davis Olive Center. More information on the California Olive Oil Day is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Examples of a USDA program designed to build up the next generation of food and farm leaders. That's coming up on This Land of Ours. USDA's recent Agricultural Outlook Forum focused on the theme of cultivating the future. That included the next generation of farm and food leaders representing and participating in various USDA programs. That included Crystal Salazar of California State University, Monterey Bay who shared some of her experiences as a member of the National Food and Agriculture Funded Next Gen program. Through that, I am actually interning with a nonprofit and I am inspiring and advocating for the youth of my community and inviting them to learn more about agriculture through our career exploration. Salazar says as the daughter of field workers and someone who desires a career path in agriculture. I really hope that one day I can maybe start a foundation or give a scholarship to the children of field workers because they do very hard work and all these students deserve a chance to be able to come to these wonderful places and have a voice at the table. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Here's Chuck Zimmerman. At the Clean Fuels Conference 2024, I am visiting with Mike Rath, who is the chair for Clean Fuels. And Mike, first of all, for people that don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President of Commodities for Darling Ingredients. It's a uh, um, rendering and uh, sustainable uh, ingredients company here based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, about 16,000 employees globally and about 280 locations. And uh, uh, we provide uh, fuel, feed, and food ingredients to the industries. As chair, I know you've um, been chair for a little while, and you've got a little, little while more to go here, as I understand it. So... How did it make you feel to become chairman? Because that's you know a lot of your compadres that have to help make that decision, right? Yeah, I guess I consider it an honor and privilege to uh, represent the industry. You know, the industry's uh, well over 20 years old now, and uh, you know I'm proud to say in the last year we've really had uh, what I would call a a storybook uh, year. Um, we've improved increased production domestically from 3 billion gallons in 22 to f over 4 billion gallons in 23, uh, over a 33% increase here. And then we've also had the Inflation Act uh, passed, which gave us more stability than ever before in uh, both an RV uh, tax uh, forward-looking uh, program of three years, uh, five years total, 
uh, about a year and a half back and, and then forward looking. And then secondly, uh, we've got an RVO uh, a couple years out here as well. So from that standpoint, we've got more stability than we have ever had. Um, granted, we would like the RVOs to be larger than they are, uh, but our industries faced these challenges before and, and, and we will get through them. And then, you know, I think there's some other milestones that uh, uh, I'd like to uh, comment on. Um, number one, we had our first uh, transatlantic uh, flight on 100% SAF uh, this last year. Um, we've also had uh, home burners that can are compatible with 100% bioheat um, that are out in the marketplace now. Uh, we had a new ASTM spec of low-grade uh low metal, I should say, a biodiesel, uh, past ASTM. And then uh, in addition to that, we've had marine legislation introduced. Um, we've also had uh, OEM uh, approval of uh, 100% RD for locomotives. So I think, uh, you know, across the spectrum of applications in transportation fuel and home heating fuel, we, we've had a lot of... Um, uh, positives come to the marketplace here. So I, I'm really looking forward to the next few years of the growth that our industry can provide and, and really the value back to agriculture. Um, I think renewables fuels is still the greatest value add to our agriculture that we have. It's come a long way. It has. And, you know, just to give you an example, the state of California with their low-carbon fuel program, uh, we have uh, replaced since 2017, we are now 60% of the diesel usage now. In other words, only uh, of the three, four billion gallons that were used, uh, 60% of that now is renewable base. And I think by 2030, that's going to be almost 100%. So, uh, you know, I think that's beyond anyone's imagination. Uh, five years ago, no less, 10 years ago. Um, and you really look at it, you know, we are, our story is so easy to tell. Uh, transportation fuel is one of the hardest ways to reduce GHGs. And yet, uh, ours uh, reduces up to 85% of GHG, of petroleum diesel, and there's really no downstream investment needed. So, you know, th that's a drop-in fuel that uh, fleets and consumers can utilize, and it helps meet uh, sustainability goals around the world. Organizationally, you've got a great team, especially they're working there in D.C., and like you said, you had some really good wins uh, this last year, and that took a lot of persistence and education because we had a lot of relatively new politicians that, you know, knew nothing about this. Uh, you're exactly right. Um, I, I think that goes to the heartbeat of uh, America, you know, and our loyalty of the Midwest uh, congressmen that we, we've known and, and uh, educated over the years, along with some of them on the coast as well. Um, you know, I'd be remiss in not mentioning, too, that we had several wins at the state level uh, of getting various uh, mandates or uh, LCFS pl programs passed. And so, you know, Clean Fuels, Donnell's program, uh, team uh, from an OEM, uh, ASTM, uh, state and federal level have just done an incredible job, and I couldn't be more proud to be associated with them. What are some of the key issues as you continue to move forward? You know, we've got our RVO and our, our tax package here, so, you know, we're, we're going to have to see what the new administration is um, and what their guidance is going to be here. But at the end of the day, I think administrations come, administrations go, and so does Congress. But at the end of the day, consumers want, uh, are concerned about uh, the environment and reducing GHG, and we've got a domestic fuel uh, that is, supports agriculture, and is really an economic driver to to the U.S. in, in all the investments. You know, we've got a 30% crush um, of oilseed increase going on in the United States over the next three years, and that's a, a five to eight billion dollar investment going in. And and that's not the supply chain downstream, railroad in, investments and in, in revenue, et cetera. So, you know, these are big big items that. Uh, really drive the heartbeat of our economy. It's been a great conference. I know our numbers are up from last year when we were in uh, Tampa as the first clean fuels uh, name for the, the conference. And what I've seen here, it seems like we have a lot more 
folks from other countries that are here going to this conference? It, it has become an international conference, and it's also, you know, downstream and upstream, all the way from the seed companies, uh, um, biogenetics, uh, to the fuel distributors, to railroads, uh, to airline companies are, are attending now. So, you know, uh, you'll, you'll hear me talk in my uh, speech later that, uh, you know, where are we going to have this in 30 years? It's, it's going to be a big, big place, number one. And number two, I think, you know, it's important to look back. Let's just go back 50 years. You know, we were looking at population growth. Uh, we were going to double from $4 billion to $8 billion, which we have. And yet we feed those. We've doubled the population, and we feed them today more efficiently than we did. Same amount of acres, less water, less fertilizer. And, oh, by the way, we support renewable fuels programs in both ethanol and renewable and bio-based diesel. So, um, you know, you go forward and look. Everyone thinks we got constraints. I don't think we have constraints. You just got to look at the past and look at what agriculture does. And we always meet and exceed expectations when the challenge is there. Yes. Well, you've done a great job over the years. I look forward to hopefully being a part uh, in years to come. So thank you very much, Mike, for visiting with me here. We are at the Clean Fuels Conference in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm Chuck Zimmerman reporting. Thank you, Chuck. This is the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the AgNet News Hour. Cindy Zimmerman has today's featured interview. I'm Scott Richman, Chief Economist for the Renewable Fuels Association. Scott, we're here at the National Ethanol Conference, and uh, one of the things that was uh, released today by RFA is the latest economic impact study for ethanol. What are some of the findings of this study? Well, the news is good again. Uh, 2023 was actually a really good year for the, for the industry. Uh, it was probably the best year in terms of profitability since uh, since around 2014. And reasons for that were uh, good domestic demand. We had a little bit uh, higher gasoline usage, uh, more sales of, of E15 last year, growing sales, uh, and actually the third strongest uh, export market we've ever had. So all that led to uh, a very good year in terms of economic impact, $50 billion uh, to GDP, about $30 billion in, uh, in earnings and income. Uh, that went that went to people, and uh, a lot of that in rural America, and then about uh, 400,000 jobs in total supported. It was actually uh, as good as the year was for the industry. It was down just a smidge from uh, 2022 in terms of the uh, economic impact uh, because commodity prices were a little bit uh, lower. So uh, a lot of the impact that the industry has is in the agriculture sector. So that was down just a little bit because of commodity prices. But again, uh, overall, uh, just a very strong year. Well, I mean, it's important, as you point out, that that it's not just for the ethanol industry, it's for everyone. Everyone benefits, kind of like a rising tide lifts all boats, right? Especially for the rural areas, as you pointed out. Absolutely. So if you spend time in, in, in rural America and in, in towns uh, that have ethanol plants, there's 200 ethanol plants, most of them uh, located around the Midwest, and it's been really good for the uh, local economies and specifically very good for uh, for corn producers that have had uh, an extra outlet that takes up about 40% of the crop. So uh, we have at this point then recovered from co- the COVID year? Uh, very, cl- very close to it. Uh, consumption's not quite, and production aren't quite it. Uh, their peaks, but they've gotten they've gotten pretty close. So uh, the you know the de- the demand situation both domestically and in, and internationally was was uh, pretty strong uh, last year. Hopefully, we'll get uh, national e- E15 this year, and that'll continue. Well, last week uh, the USDA released their latest Census of Agriculture 2022. Uh, it showed, as it shows every time. Uh, a decrease in the number of farmers, and a decrease in the amount of farmland. You did a, a little blog post on that. It talked a little bit about what, how that decrease in farmland is still, we're still as productive as, as ever as far as, as uh, corn production is concerned, right? 
Yeah, and uh, actually, if you if you look back, going back about 15, 20 years, uh, the uh, the productivity is really what's what's driven uh, the increase in the uh, in the amount of feedstock available to the ethanol industry. About three quarters of the increase uh, in feedstock availability has come from higher yields. Only about a quarter of it has come through. Uh, increased acreage, so it's it's really the you know the productivity of farmers, uh, the the technology that's gone into seed, all those sorts of things uh, that that have uh, enabled this tremendous growth in the ethanol industry without having a, a large impact on on farmland. And really, this this goes against what some people say is that we're increasing the amount of land use to make ethanol, right? Yeah, and there there is a tremendous focus, uh, especially right now with uh, the debate over sustainable aviation fuel and the life cycle analysis related to that. There's a lot of focus on what's called uh, land use change. And if you actually look at the numbers, the amount of cropland in the United States has been going down consistently. This is about a 50-year pattern. And a lot of that is from urbanization. And if you look at uh, if you look at what's happened just over the five years, the last census that was re- ag census that was released last week was for 2022. If you look at what happened just between 2017 and 2022, uh, we lost more than 10 million uh, additional acres uh, of cropland, about four percent of the, of the total cropland base. And you know that that's not that that's not that's not a positive uh, development. We want to we want to keep land in agriculture, keep land farming. So uh, you know it's the uh, there are there are people that t- that talk a lot about land use change. Unfortunately, the truth is that we're losing cropland. Well, and how does that tie into what the the big issue that we're we're really sitting on right now, as far as the ethanol industry is concerned, is is how ethanol, corn ethanol, is going to stack up as far as being used as a feedstock for sustainable aviation fuel. What does that mean for that? That's the million-dollar question right now, is what uh, a life cycle analysis tool called GREET uh, that's going to be used for sustainable aviation fuel, what that's going to uh, come out and show. And uh, the government has committed to releasing that by March the 1st, so we don't have long to wait. But one of the major questions with what what the, this version of greed is going to look like is what sort of a uh, what sort of an allocation they're going to give. What sort of really whether they're going to give a penalty uh, for, uh, for for land use change and land use change the way that it's that it's calculated. Uh, it, it's it's very model based. You can't look out there and you know just like you can count corn acres or something like that, you, you can't count land use change. And so it's model-based. There are a lot of people that take advantage of the fact that you, it's not something tangible and they make accusations out there. And so it's important when you see actual data that's based on very large, you know, very large surveys like this and they show continuing erosion in land use. Most of what you look at for the United States shows uh, shows reduced crop acreage. It shows no no expansion uh, in the in the amount of land since the renewable fuel standard was passed and expanded. And so it's really important to keep that in mind to look at the uh, to look at the cropland numbers, to look at the incredible yield improvements that have happened. And to look at really the facts on how that has allowed the ethanol industry to expand, it's not through more land. Well, you mentioned the GREET model, and we're waiting for this updated model. As far as the ethanol industry is concerned, as far as the RFA is concerned, does the GREET model need to be changed? Or is it okay the way it is as far as you're concerned? Do you want to see changes in it, or what, what changes would you like to see? Well, the GREET model is known for having the, the for capturing the latest science and data, and there's been as part of the, this update, there's been work on the GREET model to make sure that it contains 
the latest, most accurate data uh, on uh, on crop production, on different on different aspects of, of agriculture, and of course, that's exactly what we we would want to to have to have happen. We want it to represent uh, the the current state of the science. We want it to have uh, the the, late, the latest data. The concern is that there might be some you know picking and choosing of of models or some pressure because of different agendas to uh, do certain things with, with, with land use change and that would be the wrong, the wrong way to go about uh, updating and releasing GREET. The, the right way is some of the things that we know that have happened with, with, uh, with updating data to have the latest data in it. Um, is there anything else you want to add as far as that's concerned? No, it's uh, we are going to have uh, the the uh, what's called the GREET model released for sustainable aviation fuel in the next couple of weeks uh, if the government uh, follows through on its commitment. So uh, I think it's a an absolutely key time for uh, for the ethanol industry, and it's something that the RFA is going to be watching very closely. Right, very good. Well, thank you very much. Here, Scott Richmond here at the National Ethanol Conference in San Diego. I'm Cindy Zimmerman. Don't- Last year was a record-setting year for USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. Gary Crawford has more. This has been the best year that our agency has had, and we've had some good years. Terry Cosby heads up the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. He's describing the record-breaking amount of conservation work his agency did during the 2023 fiscal year, which ended September 30th. We supported close to 45,000 conservation contracts, totaling over about $2.8 billion in financial assistance. Our folks are dedicated. They stepped up. They got the job done. And then we finished the year at about 99.8% uh, completed. I, I know there was a lot of folks that didn't think we could do it, but we, we stood up to the task and we got it done. The task will be even bigger this year. Funding for conservation will rise from $2.8 billion last year to about $5 billion this year. So this time next year, Terry Cosby will likely once again say to me, It was just the best year of this agency. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And Terry Cosby, chief of the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, says that farm conservation projects can help fight climate change. If we can get a conservation practice on every acre in this country, just think about the effect it would have on climate, the cooling effect it would have, and the erosion effect, the water effect. You know, we see all of these disasters that are happening around the country right now from, you know, wildfires to, to drought to hurricanes. And it is, be, it is because that this climate is changing and that we have the resources now to help with the climate change situation. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halvertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.